We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Before we get to the question and answer session, I'd like to say just a few words about uh, the range of things that have come up in this symposium. As Roger said at the beginning, uh, we decided to make our focus not how did language begin, but how did language come to have the form it has and we've included some other things that uh, we think uh, go along with that. One thing that we've seen today is the astounding array of different types of language that have either been studied in some depth or mentioned in passing and that have come up in this symposium. Uh, we were we particularly wanted to include to include both spoken and sign languages and to take advantage of the fact that sign languages being so much younger than spoken languages uh, afford us a chance to see language at earlier stages of its development than uh, we can get very readily in spoken languages. But all kinds of, we saw that new, new linguistic forms emerge in spoken language as well, as in Carmel O'Shaughnessy's talk, where we saw how children in, um, in this Australian community have put together bits and pieces of languages used around them and created something entirely new. There were references to pigeons and creoles and other such new, uh, newly arising types of language, as well as to brand new languages like the Central Taurus Sign Language and the uh, as -Sayid Bedouin Sign Language in Southern in southern Israel. All of these things, there's, there's such a wide range of different types of language sprouting up around us in different parts of the world and offer us a chance to see languages at the very earliest stages. Yet we m must keep in mind that this is not the same thing as what the earliest stages of human language must have been like. For all of these are languages spoken or signed by individuals 
with modern human brains. And that's a big, uh, probably a very big difference. And the last talks on uh, language in the brain uh, provided three different perspectives on what the brain is doing in use of language or in when the individual is doing linguistic tasks, as well as uh, particularly in uh, Professor Mayberry's talk, how exposure to language, to any language in the early years, the earliest years of life, are, is essential to, to being able to fully master and acquire a human language. So uh, with that, I think uh, I will uh, conclude these, these remarks and turn now to the question, questions that uh, you have that you have written down and have been uh, have been collected. Uh, so this is very exciting. Um, the as you know, we just had nine wonderful talks, and um, we have uh, way more than nine wonderful questions. <laughs> but we'll do our best. Um, we'll and, uh, we'll see what we can get through. So. Um, uh, the first question uh, of many, many great questions. Thank you all for um, for excellent questions that you asked. Um, this is for uh, Ann Singa. So um, the, uh, the question is, um, uh, the, uh, this is sort of a merger of several different questions, but the general question is, um, w what was there before before the first cohort of, um, of Nicaraguan sign language uh, speakers? Uh, what, what, was, what was the setting in which this emerged? And also, um, uh, with successive cohorts, what is the relationship between the ability uh, to communicate between cohorts? So is it the case that successive cohorts are able to communicate with their predecessors, but not vice versa? And could you give us more information on that? Uh, so the first question of what came before, what did people have before? Um, if, you, if you meet deaf people in Nicaragua who are over the age of 50, um, they, they exhibit, I mean, they. These are people who were languageless in childhood, right? These are people who are the kind of people that, that Rachel was talking about. But they, and they, some of them encountered the sign language late in life and some of them did not. Um, and so the people that I've met who, are, who preceded that first cohort really range in their ability to, to participate as members of the society. That these are people who were languageless. They vary in the, how much they developed a, a home sign system, which are these uh, uh, the, that Ray Jackanoff alluded to. The, these um, simple systems that have some of the elements of of um, language that they might develop with their families. Some deaf people develop those and some people don't. So they really are variable, unlike people who are exposed to language who aren't variable. They all kind of can use their language. Um, and then the, the ability to communicate across cohorts is a really interesting one. I have lots of fun videos of that and the kinds of miscommunications that can occur. Um, but to give you a flavor for it, if you, it's kind of like interacting with someone like if you're a younger signer interacting with an older signer, someone from an earlier cohort, think of that the younger signers are more specific. They mark things more specifically. They make more distinctions in their language. So some of those distinctions aren't processed by the older uh, signers. Like if you're signing something in one location versus another, that doesn't mean anything to an older signer. So it's kind of like someone speaking a language without any of the morphology. Um, uh, you can get a lot of stuff across. You can use context. They don't notice most of the time that they're using different forms, but but when you push them on a really hard task where you have to make a certain kind of distinction with minimal pairs, they, the, a sentence that seems ambiguous to an older signer will be more specific to a younger signer. Um, and it, you know, it's kind of like talking to a non-native speaker of English, maybe, or if you have a grandmother who you know is Italian and you speak English with her, and her English isn't like yours, but it's not you don't notice it most of the time. You know, she she's a late learner of English, and and it's I think it feels like that to them. Um, the older signers think the younger signers are kind of fast and messy, and they're screwing the language up, and they, are, you know, they make these 
signs that are, that are sloppy and they drop certain important things and they put the words in all these funny orders where things get ambiguous. So. Thank you very much. So the next question, um, I'd like to, um, this is also a merger of a couple of questions. This is for Simon Kirby. Um, so the, the, the question generally is um, that, uh, that one thing that, that is not present in the experiments that you reported is social interaction between people. So this is very single speaker, single generation to next speaker, next generation. And um, uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, is there, um, is, is there an, are there important dimensions of the nature of evolution of language that, uh, that we can't capture without that kind of social interaction within generations. So just could you have a few comments on that? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so what we see um, when we started doing these experiments, we were just interested in this iterated learning process. And that first experiment I showed you where we just ended up with just a smaller and smaller number of words, and in some cases get this, this incredibly degenerate language, which only has one word for everything. That language is, is amazingly learnable. It's very easy to learn a language where you just say, ugh, for everything. Um, so we had to put in this kind of hack into the experiment where we filtered out those ambiguous items in, in sort of secret between each generation. Um, but of course, there's a much more sensible way of doing that, which we've then gone on to do, which is to add in communication. So the um, experiments that we're doing now in Edinburgh um, nearly exclusively involve interaction as well. So we have two individuals who um, um, learn their language from the previous generation and then interact in some kind of communicative task. And then the output of that is fed on to the next generation. And uh, our, our, our current uh, models and experiments and our, our theory is that you need both. So you need uh, learning, which leads to uh, simplification of structure, um, and you need communication that leads to a pressure to be expressive. And when both, um, when, then when there's this pressure to be simple plus a pressure to be expressive, that's the sweet spot that gives you linguistic structure. So I think it's, it's really, um, linguistic structure is, is the the product of a kind of um, tug of war between these two processes, wanting to be expressive with your language, but also the language needing to be learnable by the next generation. Uh, thank you. So the third question is for uh, Rachel Mayberry. Um, the question is, uh, have, you, um, have you studied how uh, the teenagers um, in, your, um, in, your, uh, uh, in your sample um, who didn't have the exposure to early language performed on non-linguistic tasks. So um, what's the relationship between performance in linguistic and non-linguistic tasks? Well, it depends on what kind of linguistic, non-linguistic task you're talking about. Um, they're very, very good at picture arrangement, you know, so that uh, elements of a story, you know, putting them together, they're quite good at that. Um, one of the teens is a fantastic drawer. He just makes beautiful, beautiful drawings and paintings. Another of the teens is fascinated with maps. They have no problems navigating, driving, um, doing tasks like this. Math skills are very, very low. Reading, they're illiterate. Those are the language skills. But for the, and, I, and we haven't really looked at a range of non-linguistic tasks. Thank you. Um, so the next question is for David Perlmutter. I think this is a really neat question. How do sign languages rhyme? <laughs> well, this question obviously comes from someone whose language is one where rhyme is a prominent feature of poetry. Um, as it happens, I've actually, I've published a paper on poetry in sign language. And one of the questions I address, it's, it starts out as, as an analysis in depth of one particular poem. And then I go on to discuss the question of what, how, let me rephrase it, how do different languages differ with respect to the resources they put at the disposal of their poets. And in particular, when there's a difference in modality between a spoken language and a sign language, 
how do the, how do spoken and sign languages differ in the resources they gi uh, give their poets for poetic expression? And so one of I don't talk about rhyme as such, but I analyze in in depth the um, the structure of this particular poem and the types, the ways the poet uses ASL for poetic effects and particularly uses of, uh, resources that ASL puts at his disposal um, that are quite unlike anything in spoken, in spoken language. And, and let me just say that I was amazed at the richness and depth I discovered in the one poem I analyzed in detail you know, I can, I can recite a poem in Russian, in French, in German, whatever. I cannot recite a poem in ASL because things are going on simultaneously with the hands, the body, the face, the facial expressions. And uh, though I sign at a very elementary level uh, with, with uh, deaf signers, I, I simply can't do all those things at once that are required for poetic effects. Uh, that are used for poetic effect in this particular poem. So that's my answer. If you're uh, interested, I can uh, tell you where to find this paper or, or uh, provide, provide it to you if you're interested. You come up and see me afterwards. All right, let's try another question um, to P Ray Jackendoff. Why would languages ever develop more complexity, embedding, et cetera, if language uh, evolves, what is the source of pressure for them to become more complex, i.e., beyond linear grammar? It's a good question that I've asked myself about a lot. Um, it actually relates to um, David's answer to the last question. So all of these strategies that we have with agreement and tenses and relative clauses and concessive clauses and all this sort of thing give us um, extra dimensions of expressivity that we can do all at once. So instead of just saying, boy, kiss, love, girl, or something like that, we can, we can say, well, we're focusing on what the boy is doing. He's kissing the girl. And that he loved is kind of backgrounded. Because, and that's conveyed by putting it in the relative clause. Um, we can make distinct, and different languages make different distinctions uh, of what kinds of things they express grammatically. So some languages will have some little operator on a verb that will tell you whether you actually saw this event yourself or somebody told you about it. They're called evidentials. They seem to be things that people want to express. Uh, and they're, to do it in a linear language, you have to say, I know, da 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 da, da and it's um, it, it's more efficient in a way in, 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 in expression to just put it as a suffix. Now, what I, I b think, if this is right, that linear languages were sort of an earlier stage in evolution of the human language capacity, it took some extra um, tweak in the genetics to make us capable of learning languages of this more complex sort. Um, again, I don't have any evidence to that. It's uh, sort of a working hypothesis to, in, in terms of which you can um, reevaluate a lot of the things that we have been studying over the years. Uh, great. Thank you very much. So um, uh, this is another merger question, a question to Edward Chang. Um, uh, so uh, let me phrase it the following way. So. Uh, we know that children, um, children are actually born with the ability to perceive more sound differences than they actually, um, than adults can. And so we actually lose uh, perceptual distinctions over time uh, as, we, as, we, um, as we acquire our native language. And uh, do, you, do you think that, um, do you think that part of what you're seeing may actually be some, the outcome of some kind of uh, synaptic pruning that may take place earlier on in childhood development is the end product. And a, re a related question is, um, do you have data on speakers of other languages? Um, if so, are there differences? And, and uh, for example, are there, 
are, would, are, is the hierarchical organization of phonemes um, different? So for example, the placement of nasals with, uh, with vowels rather than with consonants. And if, if not, what would you speculate would be you'd be likely to see in other languages? Um, I, I think that that's a, a wonderful question and one that we often uh, hear a lot about because it's one of the most uh, remarkable things about the acquisition of phonological systems is their sensitivity to, uh, to language environment. And so that's a natural one for us to look at. And there's a lot of properties in the neural recordings that we see that seem like they're specialized for the English language, not in work that I've presented today, but um, in previous work we've demonstrated that for example, you can see evidence of categorical uh, type of responses to a uh, place of articulation cues uh, like ba da ga, uh, those kind of sounds in, in the superior temporal gyrus. And that's one that we're, we're pursuing. So one, uh, can we look and look at that same distinction between ra and r and l sound, ra la, one that's very well formed in English uh, listeners but uh, loses its distinction in some Asian language. So that's work uh, in progress. Uh, but I, I think that the way I see it is that uh, a lot of the way the phonological systems are actually organized is very much driven by our acoustic sensitivities. And so what I would predict is that the major uh, principles of that taxonomy or that organization that we found actually will probably exist for almost all uh, speech sounds. But where there are these more subtle distinctions, in place of articulation is a very, uh, very good example. Uh, the uh, ra versus la distinctions is another one. These are more subtle ones that are very language specific. So, I think it's a very, we're going to see a very nuanced kind of answer to it, where there are certain things that are going to be universally observed across uh, uh, listeners of different um, different experiences, but there will be some refinement of that basic organization and that will probably be reflected in its neural activity patterns. Okay, this is, uh, re this one is about age of acquisition, uh, presumably for Dr. Mayberry. Uh, given the great influence age has on language acquisition, would acquisition of a second language at an early age enable the acquisition of a third language in adulthood? And another one also for Dr. Mayberry. Um, do you think you can use these patterns you've uh, discovered for clinical applications, uh, for clinical applications? Um, regarding age of acquisition effects on second language learning, um, we don't really, there, there, we don't really have a lot of research looking at if you know two languages, did it, will it help you learn three? Will it help you learn four? Presumably the answer is yes. But people are only starting to um, study this question. The other thing about age of acquisition effects in second language learning is that they are variable, such that um, how well one can learn to speak a second language depends upon the overlap, the language families that the two languages are from. And what seems to be a really important variable in second language learning is how much education you've received in your second language. So it is quite possible for um, people to learn a second language at near native levels um, if they're immersed in it, if they use it a lot. And in fact, some second language learners, um, the, their language dominance shifts so that they're more comfortable in their second language than they are in their first language as a function of how much they speak the language. So, but I think this notion of polyglots and people who speak a lot of languages how do we tease apart linguistic talent from um, actually just you know, going at it and learning a lot of languages and then learning and becoming familiar with the structures of languages so that you can learn them? We really don't know a lot about that. The second question in terms of uh, clinical applications, I do actually think that this work has a lot of clinical applications. I think that um, we're getting to the point where we can characterize how much language and what kind of language a child should have by a certain age um, to, to ensure that the child is on an upward trajectory for acquiring language. Likewise, I think that we're, that same kind of information we can use to see whether some children are actually in jeopardy of not acquiring language. Um, and the third aspect of this, although there are many, many more, is that now that we know that um, these young people who don't have language 
are in jeopardy of not having language at all, we can, we're in a better position to develop um, a crisis intervention, so to speak. You know, it's an emergency. Somebody doesn't have language. We need to get them as much language as possible, and we can have some idea of where we might start in that particular kind of training. But there's clearly much, much work that needs to be done. And here's the question for Dr. Fedorenko that I thought I had in my hand before. Uh, music shares many features with language, structure, syntax, etc. Do people with extensive musical training show different responses in linguistic regions when listening to or producing music compared to non-musical people? Would they respond to violation of a musical rule, in quotes, uh, e.g. E key signature, in a similar way to how others might respond to a grammatical error, for example. So I'll, 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 l l let, me, let me start with the um, second one. So the second question is um, asking about these violation of structure paradigms that have been used a lot in um, studying structure perception in music. So it's where basically you know, you hear a sequence of tones or chords, and then there is an unexpected chord or note with respect to the um, your knowledge of the tonal structure. Um, and people notice these. Um, you can find markers of these using both kind of electrophysiology methods and uh, brain imaging methods. Um, and it turns out that the kinds of errors, the kinds of um, uh, markers you get for these errors are actually quite similar to what you get for errors uh, when you encounter an ungrammaticality in language. Okay, so that's part of the evidence that people have used to argue for overlap between language and music. There is a big problem with that line of work, um, and some of you may be getting the, arriving at this already, and that is there's a lot of things that's shared between language and music in these paradigms in addition to the fact that they may share similarities at the level of you know, complex hierarchical structure. That is, you encounter surprising events, you pay attention, you may need to update your representations, it's a learning event, and indeed whenever people have tried to use control conditions to test for these kinds of lower level violations, like in Stefan Kosch's work, he often uses um, instrument change conditions. So the structure goes on as expected, but you get um, a timbre change, like for something played by a violin instead of a piano. And for all of these conditions, for, for, for that condition, you basically get exactly the same response as you do for structure violation conditions. Moreover, if you look at the responses to um, uh, very low level oddball violations, so this is like, you know, high, high, high pitch, low pitch or something like that, very, very dumb, no hierarchical structure, anything, um, again, you get very similar kinds of responses. At least in fMRI, you get exactly the same set of regions that react. So there's issues with using evidence from these violation of structure paradigms to argue for overlap in some kind of a deep level of shared structure or something like that. Um, there are some differences, again, with respect to those paradigms, there are some differences between musicians and non-musicians, um, but it's certainly the case that, just like we've known from behavior ever since like the 50s, you know, you don't need to be a trained musician to detect these violations very quickly, very efficiently, but there are some subtle differences you can report. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there, I mean, there's, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so, so the next question. This is also going to be a question merger, um, and uh, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to uh, give this question to you, David. Um, so, uh, the, the the first part of the question is: uh, since many sign language users um, uh, uh, have some degree of hearing ability, is there a significant influence of the of the local spoken language on? Uh, on the structure of the signed language. And um, the second part of this question is, what's the nature of dialectal variation, uh, uh, ge ge geographical variation in dialect in signed languages? Okay, the, f the first part, um, influence of the surrounding spoken language on sign language. Um, I would divide, I would divide the, the, the area, this question into two areas. In terms of individual vocabulary items, lexical items, there's a huge amount of borrowing uh, from English in ASL, just for individual uh, words. Uh, there are many words uh, which 
are conventionally spelled. There's a there's a manual alphabet a a you know a b c d and you can spell any word written in the Latin alphabet with this manual alphabet. So that is one. It feels sort of like a in a way a foreign element, but you know every, most ASL signers are also also know English. So a lot of things are finger spelled. Um, there, but however, there's another way that signs are created uh, by borrowing from English, and that is, these have been known as initialized signs, where you take the first letter of the English word and use the handshape from the manual alphabet, and you get whole groups of words that way. So I'll give you an example for the, well, this is the, uh, this is the manual alphabet for M, two-handed signs. This is mathematics. A, algebra. C, calculus. G, geometry. T, trigonometry. It's uh, S, statistics, and so on. You, so there's, you get a whole family of signs that are borrowed from English. The movement, the actual articulation, and so on, is native to ASL, but the handshape is expressing the first letter of the corresponding English word. Needless to say, this, this suddenly gives you a huge potential for additional vocabulary. But the way the, the question was worded, the structure of the language and the structure of the language in terms of the syntax, uh, in terms of patterns within the lexicon, in terms of the phonology, all of that is completely, uh, is, is indigenous and quite different from English, really very different from English. Now there was a second part, whoops, a second part of the question. Oh, dial yes, there is dialectal vi uh, variation. Uh, there have been studies of that under the rubric of the sociolinguistics of sign language, sociolinguistics of ASL. I'm not familiar with um, most of that work, but it does exist. Thank you. So the next question is for Ray Jackendoff, um, and I, I really like the wording of this question. The question is, does ontogeny recapitulate phylogeny in the uh, in the in the brain and evolution of language. That is, should we think about um, is it is it useful to think about the earliest stages of child syntactic acquisition as being linear syntax? That's a question I ask myself all the time, and um, part of the the well, there are earlier stages of child language acquisition that correspond to even more simple models of language, like languages that can only have one word per sentence. Um, and those are useful as well. Um, so at least the earlier, earliest stages of child language seem to be captured by very simple grammars. I've been having this discussion with people working in language acquisition about when you can detect real syntax in child language, uh, either in perception or in production. Production is always way behind perception. And I'm getting a lot of blowback from them. So it's, <laughs> um, but on the other hand, most work in language acquisition has presumed that as soon as the child starts stringing words together that there is syntax, that there are nouns and verbs. So there's a lot of negotiating that has to be done between the, you know, this program of research and the people working on language acquisition before we can really answer the question. I would love it if we could show that there's a stage of linear grammar that we can detect in child language acquisition. That would be really nice. Uh, there's a, a, a famous old book by the great Roman Jakobson called Child Language, uh, Aphasia, and uh, how do you translate it? Algemeine Lautgesetze. <laughs> General sound pattern, something like sound sound laws, where he's suggesting that what children uh, 
uh, um, uh, the order of children's acquisition parallels the order of loss in the other direction in aphasia, and this corresponds to typology among languages. And this is and this hypothesis, if we want to take about linear grammar, if we take it really seriously, is like Jakobson on steroids. Um, now I'm prepared to back off that, and uh, but it's it, you know uh, it's something that I'd like to know about, and uh, this requires really mastering a lot of the child acquisition literature and convincing people in child language acquisition that this is a question worth taking seriously. And so far, I haven't really succeeded in either of them. <laughs> This question is for Mark Aronoff. So, um, <laughs> got very excited. It's a good question. So, how, are you ready for this? Yes. Okay. How should how should we think about expressions like OMG and LOL on Twitter? Um, so, should we think about these as some as a kind of degeneration of language um, that's going to continue, or should we think of this as something else, perhaps? a general tendency toward abbreviation and efficiency. Um, yeah, so it's very interesting because, you know, OMG and LOL are very, they're complicated because uh, they involve the interaction of spoken and written language. So if you, if you don't have a writing system, you simply can't do that, right? And in fact, uh, we know a little bit about the, the, the history of, of those sorts of, of, of abbreviations. Uh, they actually go back to, uh, to biblical times. Um, and so it was apparently um, that notion of, of that interaction between spoken and written language uh, seems to, I mean, it, it arose with increased literacy in, in particular, uh, among uh, uh, among the the creators of the biblical text, and we know this from things like um, uh, uh, verses, where the um, the first letter of a poem, the first letters of lines of poems, will spell out. Uh, words and things like that, or you'll have poetry that's written in alphabetical order. And all that relates to what David was saying about it depends on what your resources are. So now that we have writing as well as speech, then we can actually play with, uh, with the interplay, the interaction between the written and the spoken language, right? Um, I think as a general rule, um, you could say that talking about language in terms of degenerating never gets you anywhere. Uh, though I must confess that I had originally um, written down a question, which I didn't submit, um, and the question was WTF. So, thank you. Great. Um, so, we next we have a question for Carmel O'Shaughnessy now. Um, uh, and the, the question is, um, uh, what, what factors predict, how much do we know about um, how, what, how, how, when a language uh, combines, uh, when, when it draws on multiple different source languages, what factors influence what is drawn from one language versus what is drawn from the other language? I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a language with similar structure except reversed, spoken in North America, Michif, which combines Cree and Canadian French. And there the verbs are from Cree and the noun structure is from French. So it's kind of like the opposite of like Walpuri. And the argument for that combination is that the verb structure is so complex that you couldn't really divide it at any point. And so if you're going to have a Cree verb, you, you have to have the whole thing. Uh, I don't have the same argument for like Walpuri. Uh, one possibility is that Walpuri verbs uh, appear more complicated in some ways in that they have several different conjugations and so on in a way that English verbs don't. And some of the speakers in the community have told me that they think of, the, uh, of English as easy to learn. And 
I think there's an idea of using English verbs or Creole-type verbs to children because it's easy, and people have said that they'll learn Walpuri as they get older. So I think it's an idea of what is easier for language learning and what can then be learned later. Uh, but I'd certainly like to know more about typologically and psychologically what might be involved there. And for closing remarks, we turn to Fred Gage of the Salk Institute, and he's also co-director of CARTA. Okay, my, my role in this is to close the meeting and uh, most importantly to elicit some applause or thanks from you for all the people that have actually done all the work. <laughs> in particular, I'd really like to thank the, uh, the chairs of the uh, session for, for picking some really outstanding speakers. This has been a, a great learning experience for all of us. But also, I was really impressed with, we, we do this a lot, and, and the questions that uh, were elicited from the audience were really coherent. Maybe it was the way you guys phrased them, but you know, it, it, it was very, very coherent and, and, very, and really quite wonderful. And some of the best answers to the questions, I think, only come when you have good questions that are being asked. So thank you guys for, for all of that. Thank you.